All right, so uh, my name is Ben Briard. I've, I'm a Red Hatter. I've been at Red Hat for eight years now, and I've spent the past three years really focusing in uh, kind of all of the technology, uh, the, and it really in the layers and in the, in the space that we're going to talk about today, going from uh, everything on the system D side to uh, container runtimes, what we do for image content, how we produce them, uh, keep everything fresh in these things, and everything we've done on the Atomic Host side, uh, and then looking forward, kind of where we're going uh, on the CoreOS side. So that's, that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. And I thought for, let's see, my clicker doesn't seem to work. Excuse me while I switch this. Okay, so I thought today uh, we'd really focus in on the why. So, like, why are we, uh, like, why are we making some changes here? What are we doing this for? Uh, some of our, or my peers, uh, have given other talks on this subject that I think kind of cover more of the how and 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 the what. So, uh, Benjamin Gilbert and Dusty May gave a really good talk at Flock on this. Um, it's the you know, if you guys want to want to learn more in this space, that's a really good one to go look. And then Colin Walters gave another one at Flock, or no, sorry, DevConf US that I think was probably more on the more on the how side. Uh, and so these are really good talks, and these guys are all brilliant. So uh, you know, I I recommend those. But today I want to talk about like the why. And I, if you've I don't know. Every time I talk, I like to tell bad jokes, so I apologize. But we're gonna we're gonna start with that now. Uh, so we got a new logo, uh, which is not new, but the colors are slightly tweaked to to align with Fedora. Uh, and so I was thinking about logos, right? Um, I always love the CoreOS logo. It's uh, it's like it's perfect. Uh, even the name is is perfect. So uh, I'm I'm really really glad that. Uh, you know these things are still still in play because uh, they're very very symbolic about uh, kind of what we're doing in the effort. Uh, but something Leonard and I have talked about is like getting we need like a real logo for System D, and you guys know we talk about System D this whole conference, right? Because this, this kind of grew out of uh, System D conf, uh, and I like System D a lot. But so I uh, there's actually services out there that will generate logos. Have you guys seen this? So these logo generators, so if you just type in a name, it'll go scour the internet. Uh, and then based on what it finds on the internet, it'll come back and give you a graphical representation of what you want to do a logo for. And so I thought, oh, well, this is perfect. So let's see, what, what would the internet say about, about System D for a logo? Do you guys, do you guys want to see this? No, nobody. Okay, a couple of people want to see. Uh, so it's a, it's the internet can be a cruel place, but uh, this was this was what uh, what came back. So, um, so I so we're we're not going to use this logo. Okay, this is not this is not good at all. Um, anyway, but I, I thought that was that was pretty funny. Okay, so uh, going into to what we want to talk about is is the you know kind of what we're doing uh, with CoreOS in the space and why. Uh, so last time I was in Europe, uh, we had a we had probably a three four day kind of planning team meeting, figuring out kind of next steps for us, what we're doing and stuff. And I got back on the plane to fly home, and over the Atlantic, uh, I was on the satellite internet, and I got a ping from my boss said. Like, hey, guess what? Uh, CoreOS is coming to Red Hat, and I thought, well, okay, this is super exciting, right? Because like, the people are brilliant. The technology is really, really good. I thought, um, but on this plane, like, I need a really big trash can to just like throw away like all my plans, right? Because everything's just out the window right now. Um, so I, I, would, I was a little bit nervous uh, flying back out here. Uh, fearing another another ping like that, but that has not happened. Uh, anyway, but I one of the reasons I like Red Hat so much is because there aren't a lot of uh, companies out there that uh, when they do an acquisition, they aggressively open source any proprietary IP, and I think that's really, really unique and something I really like about Red Hat. Um, and so primarily everything at CoreOS was open except a couple of pieces uh, for Quay, which those are those are being open source right now, so I th I, that's that's really cool and something something I really admire about uh, about the company. Um, 
but when we look at the technology there, it's uh, it's like really, really uh, compatible uh, and kind of a lot of the things that we were doing at Red Hat, uh, CoreOS was uh, also doing a, a really good job of kind of forwarding that mission. Um, and so you, you guys know uh, Tectonic is like the Kubernetes platform that CoreOS has and OpenShift is the one that Red Hat has. Um, and the two align quite well. Tectonic uh, historically has a has a stronger story on the operational side about how you instantiate the cluster, and it's it's kind of more of a self-driving model, and and the whole the whole theme of automated operations play very strongly there. Um, OpenShift. I don't I don't really want to talk too much about products today, but uh, the OpenShift side, it's a like our strength was always on like onboarding applications and and that flow to just. Uh, getting workloads on the clusters. One of the problems we've had in the cloud space is uh, companies go through these uh, initiatives and they end up with this empty cluster problem. Um, and you know, across our industry, there's stats of, I, I wanna say it's like 70% of IT projects tend to fail. Uh, so there's several conclusions we can draw from that. One is we may be solving the problems the wrong way, or two, we're all not very good at our jobs, but uh, you know, think of it what you will, but uh, that's one reason why uh, I, think, I think we've seen success in the space is because that uh, ease of onboarding applications. So long story short, putting, putting those two together is actually a pretty powerful uh, value proposition and, and what we're working on. Uh, so CoreOS is probably best known for is CoreOS, which is later renamed Container Linux. Uh, it, you know, when we when we look at this this concept that they pioneered of stripping down the OS to just a few hundred packages, like the bare essentials you need to containerize uh, applications, it's it's ultimately been incredibly successful. Um, and the things that people like about it are the fact that it's a, a you know basically just this minimal footprint. It's just the bare essentials you need. Uh, not a lot of extra stuff. So what you would traditionally get in a, a distribution like a, a Fedora, say, uh, would really strip away uh, you know, anything that's, that's not essential. And so that helps from like a security perspective, but when you're trying to ship uh, the latest software, uh, the less you have to uh, compile and build in that stack to version, uh, the, more, like, the more possible that becomes. And then of course, uh, the fact that it's the OS is basically transparent under the seam. And so like the, the update cadence and the care and feeding that sysadmins give to container Linux, we, like most of that is automated uh, where possible, primarily through the, the auto updates uh, model. And so we, the, the thinking is that the way containers work for uh, Docker, uh, you know, that type of model, the OCI model, is that everything that we ship for the application is, is bundled and isolated there and is effectively isolated from the, the operating system. So if we decouple these two things, the, the result of that is we can then automate and rev the OS without impacting the application. I mean, this makes sense, right? Um, we we need to get away from the the patch Tuesday problem of coming in once a month and figuring out what's broken, and and containers have gone a long way to to further that, uh, and you know it's it's, I mean just looking at the adoption we're seeing uh, we're seeing the results of that. So, uh, at the summit, uh, Brandon Phillips and I kind of did a little bit of a retrospective on kind of what worked and what didn't work. Looking back from at the container Linux side and the atomic side. I don't really want to rehash that whole talk, but for context, uh, I do want to hit on a couple points. Uh, most of these were uh, specific to Brandon's side. And so the, the goal is, you know, if you think of the goal as shipping a uh, new component, so a new kernel, uh, once that's ready to go and upstream cuts a release or, or when systemd cuts a, a release, uh, for example, Container Linux did a, a really good job getting those versioning, building, testing, and then shipping this one unit, right? And uh, kind of some assumptions that it would actually become this pretty clear uh, cut architecture and, and, you know, these clear layers of separation here. So, you know, the kernel, uh, system D is our, our, you know, service manager and system manager uh, right above that. Uh, and that these things always work nice together. And then, you know, Docker works nice with system D. And then, of course, the kubelet uh, will then control Docker effectively. Uh, kubelet does a lot more than just talk to the Docker APIs, right? It, it, it's, a, it's a much 
much broader. Uh, it's almost like a system manager now of its own right, where it uh, does quite a bit and you know proc and everything else on the on the system. Uh, and so, uh, <laughs> so Brandon's take on this was that uh, most of these assumptions did not hold. Uh, the the kernel was really the the primary one where, uh, from a compatibility perspective, uh, does like a, a really really good job of carrying workloads forward. Um, so again, this is uh, it's interesting when you start to think about it from the layered cake model. Um, the other thing is. From a, a Kubernetes perspective, by the way, I'm sure most of you guys know Red Hat's like heavily invested in Kubernetes. This is a huge strategic big deal for us, and we put a lot of a lot of resources into this. Um, on the, you know, basically they like updates for container Linux are done centrally, right? And you have this kind of monolithic update model where which channel you're on determines uh, the update that you're effectively subscribed to. Um, but the the cluster version uh, doesn't control or push updates down, and so you can end up in a state where uh, nodes can be at various versions of the operating system, and you don't have, uh, you know, basically like a top-down versioning uh, from this part. And and they got they got really really close to this with Tectonic, and and you know we're we're on the path, I would say. Um, but uh, this is something we think we can we can actually turn a couple knobs and actually have the the cluster drive the OS version, uh, which is powerful from a consistency state. I talked to one of the big um, one of the big cable companies uh, in North America just a few weeks ago, and their their issue right now is when some of the nodes uh, come back up from reboots, they they actually don't know. Uh, what version of CL they're gonna they're gonna reboot into, and so they uh, there's a bit of an uncertainty for them, uh, and and they have uh, a couple thousand systems running uh, right now. So this is this is like one small small thing that I think we can we can make a, a big impact on from for this use case. Um, the other big thing is I I hate this picture by the way, so I just kind of put it up to to make a point. Uh, the container ecosystem and everything from this is from CNCF uh, is is changed a lot over the past five years. Um, th I I think a lot of us when we see stuff like this, it's like oh my god, this is a great good, this is a good looking sushi menu, and I want give me one of those, one of these, take three of those, um, and it's all going to work together. Um, and I just I experience tells me that that's. It's many many cases not not true, um, and we so we and I think when the container kind of revolution kicked off, right? And Docker really did a, a phenomenal job uh, helping people understand the concepts and, and seeing the value of this. Um, but we've seen like proliferation at many different levels. So uh, there's now there's far more container runtimes. You guys, it's kind of the uh, the. I don't know the Greek tragedy of open source is there's like 500 ways to do everything. We probably have 40 different ways to run containers in Linux, maybe maybe more. Um, but we've we've got more, and and they're becoming highly specialized in the runtime space. So anything from you know technologies like Scone or whatever that uh, they use uh, some of the CPU uh, privilege write spaces and stuff. Um, so that we've got. You've got this explosion of projects in this space, um, and and everybody's trying to build these uh, distributed systems that like, actually solve real problems. And it's pretty easy to um, pick and choose and build uh, a cluster. But what's incredibly difficult is versioning and life cycling so many different disparate uh, projects that all fit together. Uh, it's it's incredibly difficult, and it's a it's a trap that I think a lot of us fall into that. That I, I can do this, not not should I do this, um, and so uh, where this and I'll, I'll give you a, another good example of this is uh, a different telco in in North America. Uh, they have a they have a huge uh, Kubernetes system, and a lot of their nodes, the file systems were flipping to uh, read only, just like randomly throughout the whole thing. And you know they call us and say, Red Hat, your file systems suck. And I said, Well, no, they don't. They don't suck. They work for a lot of people, actually. <laughs> uh, and so we we traced it down to the actual problem was was a bug in Prometheus, actually, for them. And because of the endpoint metrics, which is like you would never ever 
Like, why would you ever think something that reads endpoints and collects metrics would, would result in that? I, I surely never would have. Um, but it's interesting how interconnected all these pieces are. Um, and so that was just one thing. And again, that, that bug has been fixed upstream. Um, I, I think one of the biggest traps uh, we run into here is actually on the logging side of the way containers just spew everything to standard out and, and the bottleneck that creates at scale um, is, has been, that's a, a really challenging way. So I think like a reality is yes, containers of course help uh, from the OS and the application side, but then when we look at larger distributed systems, uh, these layers are so much like deeper and tightly coupled than than we'd like to admit, right? We think they're just all APIs that are going to talk and everything's good, uh, but I'm I'm not really I'm not convinced that's the case. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but uh, experience says says otherwise. Okay, so let's so that's a, a little bit of context. So uh, again, uh, every everything in this really, really successful. Um, but there, there are a few knobs that we can turn that we think we can, we can make things better uh, at just the OS level itself. Um, so uh, at, at Red Hat, you know, again, we, we have like a product path, and I don't really want to talk too much about that. But um, what we're doing in that sense is basically taking the best of both uh, Atomic Host and Container Linux. And really I'm such a big fan of just the the user experience of everything from container Linux meaning just the the way it's built the mission the vision um, everything that you know in in reality in in a kubernetes environment you really shouldn't should not have to SSH into a node and and that's a concept that we we really want to bring forward um, and then of course from the atomic side is actually uh, you know a lot of the Linux stuff that we do at Red Hat and how the how the host is actually composed. So there was a sarcastic tweet a while back I wanted to find, but I could not find. Finding old uh, tweets is tough, but there was one that said something like, "Oh God, uh, RPM OS tree. That's really what CoreOS needs to get better, right?" Um, <laughs> I I couldn't remember who 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 made that crack, but uh, anyway, RPM OS tree. I, I on one hand I'm I'm sympathetic to that, but it, it is quite good technology, and we can. Uh, put out spins really, really rapidly uh, in in Kubernetes and ship updates as container images, which is uh, really appealing because when you look at mirroring content uh, uh, for like disconnected environments and so forth, uh, container images are a really, really powerful vehicle for that because you're not having to not even to grab yet another uh, content type, not a, a, another repo to to set up. You, everybody pretty much already has. Uh, some type of, of registry. So specifically, we are making a few changes on the product side. These are these uh, some of these are different on the Fedora side, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but basically, going back to the the linearizing updates from the Kubernetes cluster perspective and really driving that down. Uh, w one of the other realizations uh, from the upstream side is that containerizing the kubelet uh, probably creates as many problems as it solves. Uh, so whether you're running the kubelet as a container or in the OS Compose, uh, you, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for that one way or another, and containerizing that is actually uh, it's become problematic in some ways. Uh, okay, I got to speed up. Um, anyway, containerizing it works great for small POCs. There are uh, a lot of code paths though that never never really get tested upstream, especially in the storage space. So uh, we're making the conscious decision to move that into the host, and then again. On the, on the product side, this is perfectly versioned uh, for Kubernetes, so we'll be driving that stack down. Uh, it's a little bit different, though, on the Fedora side because, um, again, that's that's all from like the Kube OpenShift model. On Fedora Core OS, uh, we really want to be less opinionated. We we want to be we want to find that right balance between uh, being opinionated and just like general purpose operating system. We already have plenty of those. We don't need another one. Uh, so uh, CoreOS does a great job right now of just when you when you install it out of the box, you get this, uh, you know, obviously this minimal container uh, host that's ready to go, ready to, to take on workloads. Uh, and kind of that, that, that mindset is what we want to carry forward. Um, so again, this is, this is becoming the, the upstream to what we're doing uh, on the Red Hat side. Um, Keep the same mission. Uh, when we look at the release, we're we're marching towards uh, getting regular releases out uh, next year. Uh, I'm I'm hoping this lands with Fedora 30. Uh, we definitely want to keep the same alpha beta stable uh, kind of mentality going here. 
and uh, we we are going to be plumbing this into kind of a lot of the the CI work that's been going on at Red Hat over the past couple of years, which is something I'm super excited about. Uh, and that that's yeah, that's a that's a that's a big deal for us. Um, the update model is, is going to change uh, from the Omaha and and uh, update engine side. Um, we the predator the the successor to uh, to Omaha is called Cincinnati. Again, I don't know where the names come from, but uh, some other uh, Midwest city. Um, and so uh, that's actually going to be uh, tweaked a bit to, uh, to update standalone host. So again, you'll be able to do the same kind of model uh, for CL, where if you want to deploy it in a in a large cluster or uh, have a standalone nodes that just uh, update themselves, we'll be doing that. Um, from a runtime perspective, I don't I don't actually think we've fleshed out which runtimes are going to be included, but. Um, you know, probably these, uh, and I think I think we'd be open to others. So, uh, if other people have ideas or things they want to see, we definitely want to capture that and hear it. Um, so, I, I do want to go back to the whys a little bit here. You guys know the five whys. If you ask somebody reasons for something, they'll never tell you everything at first, right? They'll they'll slowly open up everything. So, if you have kids, this is like free parenting advice. Like, keep asking why. Uh, but so uh, I think like the main reason uh, we're we're looking at making some changes is just acknowledging that uh, the ecosystem is quite different now than it was uh, five years ago, and and hopefully everybody here kind of kind of feels and realizes that. And there and there are some things we can do at the OS level uh, to make things work better. Um, the community development angle is a big one. Uh, that's something that's you know obviously super important to us. Um, you know, I think historically, container and Linux uh, seem to be driven by uh, like super smart people, um, small team, and and there 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 definitely was some outside development in the OS, um, but but not all that much. And so this is something where we're hoping to benefit from from expanding that, and and we we actually that's that's an easy way to actually drive a heck of a lot of value uh, from Fedora itself. Um, and then, of course, that ties down into sustainability, right? It's no good to uh, have an OS and use it for high-value systems if uh, you don't think it's going to be there in six months or a year or ten years, right? So the sustainability side uh, is a big deal for us. Um, and then, again, if we, if, we, if we do this right and tweak the right knobs, the potential for growing the user base is huge. Um, and I have one minute left, so I got to wrap up. But uh, and then I just briefly future opportunities. I, I don't have much specific to say here, other than uh, we actually there's internal talks about like all kinds of stuff that we can do uh, with just how we version these lower uh, like pieces of the OS and 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 get this going. So we're actually really excited about uh, what this is going to look like one to two years from now, and so. Actually, hoping to come back and kind of do a retrospective, maybe, uh, with more guys from the team on kind of what what this looks like and the results from it. But uh, that's that's uh, super exciting to me. So I'm going to wrap up. But uh, I guess here's kind of some of the other talks I talked about. Uh, we don't have a very good website right now. We'll fix that when we start getting releases and actually do the launch. Uh, but you know, again, we are we're trying to have all the discussions out on GitHub right now. So uh, definitely encourage you guys if you're interested in this space, which hopefully hopefully you are, uh, please swing by and we want that feedback and you know make sure that we're doing everything we can. All right. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking. Thanks for coming.